Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the International Sportsman's Exposition. This is our first stop on the exposition trail that takes us to Denver, to Salt Lake City, Phoenix, God knows where we're going after that. But I'll tell you, nothing's as good as the Sacramento, the Northern California International Sportsman's Expo. I'm Sepp Hendrickson, the host of California Sportsman Radio Show every Saturday morning from 6 to 8 a.m. And I'm glad you're here. I hope some of you give us a good listen and find out how we bring you the best in the West through guides and entertainment. We call it infotainment on California Sportsman. Since the inception of our new, or since the acceptance, since the appointment of our new director of fishing game three years ago, I have been communicating a great deal with the department and with Chuck Bonham. And I'll tell you what, never in my life have I seen the opportunity that you're about to have. Chuck and I talk and he came to me one day and he said, Sepp, what can you need? What do you need? What can I do? And I said, being the cocky guy that I am, well, how about getting me the director, the deputy director, the chief of fisheries, the chief of wildlife, and the chief of law enforcement division, and set them up on the stage, and let's ask questions to them. Damn, I didn't think he was going to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, here it is. It's happening today right here at the Sacramento ISE. I'd like to introduce you right now to the director of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Mr. Chuck Bonham. Hey, thanks, Sepp. I'm going to introduce our team up here real quick, and then we're just going to go straight to questions. But what do y'all think? Let's just make this an annual event. And I also bet we're going to have more questions than we have time. So let's make sure we figure out a way to continue the conversation. I, as director, these guys as our senior leadership, we're pretty much willing to go anywhere and sit down with any part of our sporting community when we can get it scheduled, get the right venue, and hear from you. That's part of our job. It's how we know what we need to focus on, and it's how we know what we need to improve upon in the future. So let me introduce these guys real quick. Over the course of the hour, what I hope to have a chance to do is to introduce myself personally to you. So I've been on the job a little over two years. When I started, I had a full head of hair. Uh, it is the world's greatest job because of the department's mission, which is to take care of this state's wildlife for its ecological value and its use and enjoyment in perpetuity. Right here, I've got Stafford Lair. Stafford's our fisheries branch chief. Uh, he's been at the department over 20 years. Uh, he has been heavily involved in native trout and other trout fishery restorations for that entire career. Loads his own ammo. I've got Dr. Eric Loft, who is the chief of our wildlife branch. Uh, Dr. Loft has a PhD, I think, in deer migration population dynamics in Northern California. I've got Chief Carrion, who I think started hunting around five years of age. That's what your bio says. You got it. Uh, started going. And he's now in charge of our law enforcement division, which, by the way, in the last two years, we've been able to get to the highest level it's been in 20 years. And I've got our deputy director for wildlife and fisheries, Dan Paragari. He's been at the department about 30 years, I think, and is one of the most avid, uh, if not rabid, duck hunters I've met in my experience. So when we get wildlife and fisheries questions in the department, this is the 100 plus years of experience I turn to when we're sorting through difficult problems. So with that, what do you say we get started? I just want to uh, get started by thanking all of you for being here. You guys can use that mic as we move around getting questions asked. And I have in advance asked a couple of members of the press to ask questions. And the first one that I'm going to ask about, you probably have heard me mention him before, and he's been a guest on my show. I've got Bill Carr, the editor of Western Outdoor News, here joining us this morning. Bill, I'm sure you've got a question for the department. Fire away. Thank you, Sepp. Thank you, gentlemen, for showing up. It's great of you to do that. Open yourself up like this. My gosh. Chuck, this question is for you as the director of the department and the future of it and the direction that we're going. Your department has 3,000 of the best, most qualified professional fish and wildlife people probably in the country that you can fall back on for information. And yet last year, a number of critical wildlife management tools were taken out of your hands through the actions of legislative action, 
and anti-hunting animal rights groups' efforts. My question to you is, what are your plans in the future to ensure wildlife management issues are left up, left up to the professionals within your department and not the whims of politicians or animal rights groups? Hey, so let me, let me start first by just thanking Bill. Bill, Sepp, many in the room are a uh, dwindling breed, which is our outdoor writers and those who provide communication back to you as hunters and anglers in the state. But for their focus on what we're doing, their ability to watch us, their ability to offer criticisms, we wouldn't be in a perpetual loop of improving ourselves. So Bill, thank you for your attention to our department. We saw each other in May at the Trout Opener in Bishop last year, actually end of April-ish, and <clears throat> As always, I'll remind you, Bill, you've got an open door, you and the Western Outdoor News, to call me personally. Come in anytime you want, sit down, have a Q&A, and write about it how you may wish. So let me give you three specific things we've done in two years to ensure that science is a foundation for our department, and then turn to the question you ask about politics. So when I came in the door, our department was in a very low morale spot. In, th in two years, we've done three things that I think are beneficial for science. We've gone to our staff, whom are biologists and environmental scientists, and we were able to make some hard decisions to provide that part of our department a pay increase. Second thing we were able to do is hear some of the feedback from our scientific staff. One of the things they told us is, Chuck, We've been talking for about a decade about the need to get access to scientific journals so that we can go for a relatively low cost online and to services, see scientific journals and use that material when we're doing our job. And for at least a decade, the department had not been able to deliver on that desire. I'm here to tell you, for the first time in the two years we've been in leadership, we've gone out and we've gotten our scientists a subscription to PoQuest at a relatively low cost to give our scientists access to journals and literature so they can do their job. Last thing we've done is we've created a scientific institute in the department, first time we've ever done it, to bring together all the scientists. We've published our first ever guidelines for scientific ethics. We've published our first ever guidelines for doing peer review around our own departmental scientific work. Let's turn to your political question. Here's my ideal, flat out, Bottom line, my ideal for the future is that when we run into wildlife management questions in the state of California, they are left to the professionals to make a recommendation to the Fish and Game Commission, and then in a public due process proceeding, the commission deliberates about the best outcome for the future of California. The way we get to that ideal, in my opinion, is to improve the quality of our work, to improve the credibility of our recommendations to the commission, and to foster greater involvement by you, the sporting community, in front of the commission. I think when we can stand up those components of our work, we'll be able better to argue to the legislative arm of government that these decisions are best left to the professionals. The exact structure created both in our constitution for the commission and in our executive branch through the department. I am trying to create an atmosphere of professionalism and product that allows us to offer a counterbalance to the urgency and sometimes too quick pace in the legislature to grab these topics and resolve them through the legislative forum when in fact they're better off left to the experts involved. Does that answer your question, William? What other part did I'll give you a quick follow up? Hang on. Why would we even give a voice to people like animal rights activists and anti hunters? who are dedicated in their very existence to eliminating hunting in California, why would we even listen to what they have to say when hunting is not a part of their agenda? Hey, so thanks for the follow-up uh, question, Bill. Let me just tell my one and only fish story uh, during this hour. So I got to judge a photo contest about a year and a half ago. We asked people to go out and take photos of wildlife action on public lands, and I got to pick the winner. 
The winning shot I picked was a photo of a gentleman shooting some series at Clear Lake. Uh, the first shot in the series was a bird flying into the lake and capturing a fish and flying off. Pretty cool shot. A subsequent uh, shot in the series was another bird flying into the frame. Pretty good shot. The winning photo. Two birds, one fish. One bird with its talons in the head flying one direction. The other bird with its talons in the tail flying the opposite direction. And I thought that's too priceless. Life at the department is like that fish. We have a jurisdiction that covers 160,000 square miles, often all, almost 30,000 miles of rivers and streams, almost 5,000 lakes, 6,400 species, 300 plus of them are protected in some form legally, and we're right in the middle of that with 38 million people, only about 2 million of whom purchase a sport fishing or a hunting license. That tension of all of that that's balled up in 38 million people pushing and pulling, that's the department as the fish stuck in the middle between competing odds. Bill, we're a public entity. We don't work for any one particular special interest group. We're driven by our mission. Our mission is to protect and take care of this state's fish, wildlife, and plants, and the habitat they depend upon for their ecological value, as well as their use and enjoyment for Californians. Look, I spent my 20s in the outdoor education field. I traveled the world doing things in the wilderness. I put myself through law school at great expense, strictly for the purpose of becoming a lawyer for the fish. I went to work for a decade plus in this state for Trout Unlimited, who in this room has actually been in a courtroom as a lawyer defending the fish on the side of the public interest? I think I can raise my hand on that point. It's from that background that I come to this position as director, and I'll tell you, if your question is, will your grandson or your granddaughter be able to hunt and fish in California? You betcha. Why? Because I hope my two-year-old son who I left this morning trying to potty train, which I think will be hopefully more difficult than the questions I'm gonna to get today. Uh, I hope he has an opportunity to hunt and fish. We can't say no to any part of that 38 million population in the public debate, but we can remain true to our mission, our belief in science, and our mission requires us to create that future that allows you to use these resources, hunting and fishing, bar none. All right, our next question is coming to you from Mike Ogney. He's the guy that puts out usafishing.com and a regular on the California Sportsman Show. Mike. Thank you, Seth. I guess this would be a Chuck for, uh, combination question for both uh, Chuck and Stafford. With um, less than 6% of the salmon that are released out of the hatcheries upriver, able to even make it down into the estuary. So many fish are lost to the, uh, to the pumps, and so, many, so few fish are getting back. Now, in the past, we know that the uh, cross-channel gates and uh, upriver uh, releases have really dropped the number of fish able to make it out to sea, so have water diversion. But looking ahead, what is the department looking to do to improve the viability of our hatchery fish to be sure that we get them out to the ocean? Let me hand this over mostly to Stafford, but just say we have been spending a lot of time with uh, the salmon constituencies, Dick Pools in the audience, Roger Thomas in the audience. We know the Golden Gate Salmon Association's got a short list of, I think, 28 projects. We've been providing input into those projects. Those are many of the things we think might be on our future for pursuing to provide better benefit for salmon. But when it comes to the straying hatchery question, let me hand it over to Stafford. All right, um, so everyone needs to understand that we produce about 40 million salmon smolts across the eight anadromous hatcheries in the state of California, whether they're mitigation hatcheries, the most, all of them are mitigation hatcheries, but they're spread from the San Joaquin system up through the Sacramento system over on the Trinity Klamath system. And these fish um, were the hatcheries exist to mitigate for the lost habitat, the, 
the dams. And so where we're at right now is the best available science. It was produced in a recent report that was commissioned by Congress, administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, that is helping guide where do we need to go with our hatchery practices. So right now, with the approximately 40 million fish that are produced in the anadromous hatcheries, about 16 million of those fish are placed in net pens. And that is solely to provide them that, that kick to get them through the crisis of the central delta and everything that goes along there. There is a lot of strain that goes on. These fish, they don't necessarily go back to their, what we call their natal stream. It is a problem. So how do we best address this? Well, the Hatchery Scientific Review has laid out a series of recommendations. We're in collaboration with the commercial salmon fishing um, uh, interest. There's a barge experiment. We're trying to figure out is there a better way to imprint these fish to get them to go back to the streams where they belong. And the question comes up, this is a crisis year. Let me just say, we're pre uh, facing an unprecedented situation with drought in the state of California. Everything that we faced in 1976 and 77, throw it out the window, folks. You got 38.2 billion people. You, in addition to that, you have every, almost every salmonid species in the Delta is listed as federally threatened, state threatened, or state and federally endangered. We're in a new world, and I cannot emphasize enough, we're looking at that problem very closely. The trucking and the net pen will go on this year. Are there things that we can do differently? I believe we can. We're gonna let some of the science that we're conducting right now help guide us to get there. And I think we're just gonna have to kind of let it play out. And this drought, all bets are off. Let me step just quickly add a couple things. Bill, I forgot to say that I'm really thankful that in the editorial y'all wrote, you started by calling me a nice guy. So thanks for that. <laughs> and the other thing I'd say is I've been thinking about water law and salmon for quite some time in my professional career. Let me take that hatchery question and shift it over to the inland side. And just remind folks, since we've been in leadership, since I've been director in two years, our inland production's going up, not down. Let's take the three counties on the east side, Alpine, Mono, and Inyo. In 2011, it was 2.29 million. In 2012, it was 2.81 million. And in 2013, it was 3.06 million. And I think that we, as leadership, Stafford at the helm here, have got our production back up to about 95% of what it was on the inland front prior to all the litigation we faced a couple of years ago, okay? And as director, we've survived two major litigation attacks. Now, I could have folded. I could have said, don't defend. We defended our environmental impact report over our whole hatchery system, which would have shut down our hatchery work. We made the decision to defend. We won. And more recently, we've been sued in federal district court claiming, the uh, plaintiffs allege, that our production of fish and the placement of them is a pollutant action, you know, putting a pollutant into a waterway under the Clean Water Act. The question came to us, roll over or not? We decided no, we were going to defend, and we just prevailed, I think, about a month and a half ago. All right, I've got a quick question from someone in the audience I'd like to share. And this was from an El Dorado County Fish and Game Commissioner, Carl Whelan. Thank you for your question. And the question is, and it's partially been answered already, the direction of the strategic vision process seems to indicate that sportsmen should be concerned about the future of hunting and fishing in California. What can you offer to assure sportsmen that the department and the commission is protecting the sportsmen's interests? I can offer two commitments. The first is with me and this department, you will always have an open door and you will always be the cornerstone. You're our history. 
Sportsmen and women are the original conservationists. We knew this in the 1880s when Teddy Roosevelt reached out to a good friend of his, George Bird Grinnell, whom some have said is the original American conservationist, and they created the Boone and Crockett Club. Why? To go out and persuade Congress to create preserves for elk and antelope around the country. We knew that in the 40s and 50s when Aldo Leopold published great work about remaining true to both your scientific wildlife principles and developing a hunting ethic for sportsmen in the country. You have always been our foundation. You will always be our core uh, constituency going forward. You have an open door with us. The other thing I can offer is, as we're achieving our habitat conservation and species management responsibilities, our goal, is to ensure healthy populations of these wildlife and fish across the state so we have better and more opportunity to enjoy them. Since we've been around, we've increased what's called the SHARE program. That is a way in which we provide funding to increase access for hunting on private lands. We've, I would think, let me tell you this, we've increased in the last two years, I believe, through our hunter education classes, by 23.7% the number of students we're running through our education classes. This, last year we did 31,000 students. That's a 23.7% prior to when we were in leadership two years ago. And at the classes level we did 3,500, 3,542 classes last year. That's a 52% increase prior to two years ago. Why does that matter? If you're worried about your future, our future for hunting and fishing in this state is what we're each doing to build the next generation by talking to our children and grandchildren and bringing them into the fold through hunter education courses. Thank you, Chuck. All right, our next question is another one of our invited guests to ask a question. Yes. This time, this, this man has been a editor of the Fish Sniffer for probably 25 years. Dan Bacher with the Fish Sniffer has our next question. The uh, entire Delta ecosystem continues to collapse. The 2013 populations of Delta smelt and American shad were the second lowest in the 46 years of the DFW's fall midwater trawl survey. Winter run Chinook numbers continue to plummet. When is the department going to take a more aggressive approach to stop the collapse of the Delta ecosystem and Central Valley salmon, and how is it going to deal with the current drought in California? Uh, it's really hard to hear, but Dan's question boiled down was, A, what are you going to do about drought, and B, when are we going to stand up and take a more aggressive approach to defend in the Delta? And could someone please next ask a question that goes to one of these guys so I don't spend up talking the whole time? They're way more interesting than I am. Uh, Dan, let me start with drought. Look, I'll be honest, y'all, I don't know. We're going into uncharted territories. Um, water and the management of it is one of the more difficult natural resources issues in the West. It always has been in California. Water defines California either because of its scarcity or because of its abundance. Um, we're looking at long range forecasts that don't have us sleeping well at night on the fisheries management side. Um, we are thinking about emergency actions that fit within our jurisdiction or the commissions. We know that anglers are as hunters, the original conservationists, and may be willing to help us avoid substantial impact to listed runs. We're preparing for the eventuality, potentially, of needing to rescue and move fish around the state. Um, we know that our properties will suffer where we provide recreational opportunity to you because we'll have an inability uh, to move water to them. So Dan, it's very much on our mind. Let me turn to the Delta. I think we actually have stood up in the two years we've been in leadership. I'll give you a specific example. When I came in the door and the Brown administration came in the door, we were looking at a proposal in the Delta from the last administration that was a preliminary project about doing things in the Delta that would have allowed about 5.9 million acre feet of delivery to Southern California. 
And we and our federal agency counterparts sent a strong signal that that contemplation of a project would not be permittable. We're doing other things in the Delta. Uh, in a grand sense, what we need to do in the Delta, in my mind, is go to Habitat and do a very ambitious habitat restoration program. In addition, we need to ensure more ecological flow runs out the Golden Gate. Um, in addition, we need to get off of our over-reliance on pumping in the South Delta, which creates a reverse flow effect and it confuses the fish, uh, which contributes to the fact that if you're a small fish and you're stuck in that part of the Delta, two out of three fish down there die. That's because of the over-reliance on the pumping. So it's the combination of thinking across a large landscape, investing in a very ambitious restoration program to restore tidal marsh, riparian habitat, reducing reliance on delta pumping, and ensuring more ecological flow goes out the Golden Gate that I think will help turn things around in the delta. All right, thank you. All right, we have one I'm sure that uh, Lofter Perigary is gonna enjoy this one. I've heard this from several people over the years. Could we have one deer tag for A, B, C, and D zones. It would, uh, it would hurt more places if, I can't read that one. If we could hunt all four zones on one tag, it would help the extra communities and the economies in the area. Who's got it? Eric, Eric Loft. We get this one a lot, Sepp. Uh, yeah, uh, we could do that. We've looked at the data and what it shows is that second deer tag it does, there's not much success as it relates to that second deer tag. There are not that many guys out there that are pulling in that second deer. Uh, we actually have looked at that in, in, uh, in the B zones, I think, as some of you know. We've, we've been entertained and gone that way. Uh, but we really are looking at the population trends in deer. Folks keep saying we're only there about the money. But if you look at 10 years ago, 20 years ago, in terms of how many deer tags we authorized, we are down over that 20-year period, clearly. The deer populations uh, clearly are not what they were in their peak in the mid-60s. And, uh, and, and that's what we're living with now is trying to figure out, okay, how do we go about trying to reverse that trend? That is what really matters is the carrying capacity of the habitat, working with the federal agencies on land management activities as well as habitat restoration, habitat improvement. Uh, so that's really where we're heading. The one deer tag thing, uh, that's an option that we look at annually when we propose our regulations. All right, thank you, doctor. I had another quick question and I don't see it here in my hand. I'm gonna, I'll dig it out and get it for you from the audience that was related to that, so we will be back. The next question is coming from somebody I, that I know a lot of you know. It's Dave Hurley with a hot sheet. If you receive the hot sheet or you listen to California Sportsman, you hear him on there. Dave, what's your question for the panel? Thank you. First off, I'd also like to express my appreciation for your willingness to be here. My question has to do with my favorite fish, the striped bass. As you know, the latest fall fish abundance survey, the striped bass index is 70, the third lowest in history. Uh, as we put together a three time a week report, we know, I know how important the striped bass is to the economy from Calusa down to Monterey. And my question is, what actions does the Department of Fish and Game look at in terms of developing a self-sustaining as the population has plummeted from about 5 million at the late 60s to about 300,000 to 400,000 now of adult population? Are there some measures that can be taken? And uh, what are the proposals? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. So. Um, my first introduction to you as Chief of Fisheries in a formal event was the uncomfortable public meeting that we did in Rio uh, Vista with uh, where over 400 of you um, wanted to take my head off. Um, that was when we were attempting to propose to the commission um, a bag limit and size uh, modification. Uh, what an experience. That being said, let me touch upon the data you cited. You are correct. The numbers from the 60s are nowhere near where they are today. But let me put it into perspective. The third lowest index ever on record. Why are we even talking about the th third lowest index on record? The difference between 
what went on since the year 2000 and the, um, the 1990s and the 80s and the 60s is almost an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude. So to me, the third lowest on, in, on record is irrelevant. The population has crashed since 2000. The striped bass fishery is very important to the state of California. Are there problems with striped bass, predation hotspots, where fish get congregated? Absolutely. Striped bass is a problem in certain areas of the delta with predation on our sensitive fishes. How do we manage it any different? We got to restore the ecosystem. The ecosystem is in trouble, and the data from 2000 across all the sweetest species is showing that. Secondarily is, we're talking a half billion dollar economy that drives off of this multitude of fisheries, striped bass, salmon, steelhead, sturgeon, largemouth bass. So it's, it's a balancing that we have to do. And I don't have the answer because you're not gonna get striped bass increasing with everything else going on at this point. But I would just ask you, take a step back and look at it in total because it's all in trouble. And Chuck has something else to add. Let me um, connect the striped bass question to my comment about restoration in the Delta, which in isolation probably causes a few of you to just shake your head and say that's not enough, which is why there's a multiple prong effort in the Delta to restore an ecosystem. But let's just use restoration. So what you'll find in some of the places in the Delta is our waterways have been straightened over time. Right? They become more of delivery canals rather than meandering streams that connect intertidally to floodplain. And when you look at that habitat, what you see is sometimes a lack of riparian cover. Why does that matter for striped bass? Well, a hypothesis is a major pressure on striped uh, on salmon is predation by striped bass to salmon. Well, another hypothesis could be that if you restore riparian cover, create mandarins, meandering streamway, then salmon, as they're migrating, will have refugia to hide in more darkness from the predator, striped bass. That actually might be a habitat restoration conservation measure, which will reduce the tension between the two fisheries and obviate some of the need to focus at it through the lens of just take by bass onto salmon. So there's several strategies that we can employ, and that recreation of habitat to deal with the interface between those two fish is one of the things we're looking at. That brings up a question I'd like to ask, and it kind of feeds right into it. If, in fact, we're out there in the Delta and everything's going just peaches and cream and we're, we're taking care of it, this question that the guys asked me here, and it's a, it's a little old with the tunnel and other discussions that we're having, is why are we still losing so many fish on the screens? You know, it, because nothing's been changed, actually. Right. But Chuck, can you give us a quick one on that? I can. Uh... The, the first thing I do is say something I forgot to say when Dan asked his drought question. One of the things that will be most hard for all of us, and particularly the department in the coming months, is we actually have an ecological tension. So on the Sacramento side, we have a, a very large reservoir at the top of the system. It has cold water in a cold water pool, Shasta. We hold that cold water for delivery at certain times of year to the benefit primarily winter run salmon as they're coming up the system. Holding that water and making that management decision can be in tension with the need to release water, have it come down through the delta and out the gate to benefit long fin smelt and delta smelt. It's hard sometimes to literally take the one drop of water and allow it to be in both places to benefit each species. So you'll find that some of these drought decisions actually are about water management when we have species conflict. Now, things aren't going hunky-dory in the Delta, so don't let us leave you that impression. 
okay? But when it comes to screens, you need to know that when we stopped building our water delivery infrastructure, more or less, we stopped with a pumping system in the South Delta. Actually, in 1964, our department went to the American Fisheries Society and said, if that's the end of the infrastructure, you're gonna drive the fish into extinction. Why? It creates a reverse flow effect and it draws unnatural flow patterns down to the South Delta. Those facilities also have 1950s something screen technology. The world has advanced so much on screening. We just went up into the Upper Sacramento on the Red Bluff Diversion Dam facility, really big intakes. We've got modern screens on them. You've got modern requirements like sweeping velocities. Uh, there is a way to create a permitting regime which put the burden of non-compliance on the diverter. So these things like sweeping velocity, modern screening criteria, and permit burden on the diverter are all the things we're bringing to the, new, to the problems in the Delta. With the Army Corps of Engineers now wanting apparently to clear all the riprap in the Delta and get out all of the, what I would call riparian habitat down there, isn't that detrimental to the population of salmon as well as all the species of fish down there in the Delta, if that's ripped out? It is, Sep, which is why, as one of the things we've done uh, during our leadership in the last two years, we got permission and we sued the United States Army Corps of Engineers in federal court for their policy to require us to rip out that riparian habitat. The fact of the matter is 5% of the habitat that's left in the Central Valley that's riparian is on those levees. 95% of our riparian habitat in the Delta and the Central Valley, gone. We're fighting for that last 5%, which is why we went to federal court to stop that policy being implemented by the Corps here in the state of California. Well, here's one for you that a couple of you guys might want to talk about. Can we use sonar count stations in river and use actual escapement counts on the Klamath and Trinity rivers instead of the ocean abundance estimates, as estimates are often quite wrong? Stafford, I bet you get that one. Great question. Um, these are biological systems. They're very difficult to get the exact data, so we deal with models. Models are only good as the data you get into them. In the Klamath system, we've got the best available information, the most complex set of information that feeds into those models. Those models then become extrapolated, and what I mean by that is you got a number here, you think it's exact, you make an estimate of the number up here. They're subject to um, error. So we're never gonna know exactly how many river fish are in the river system or in the ocean. Their estimates and their best, they're based upon the best amount of information that we can feed into these highly complex mathematical models. So the Klamath is the ideal in the Sacramento-San Joaquin system. I think we're a lot closer in the San Joaquin system, Sacramento system in getting our estimates this year than we probably were on the Klamath system. We don't understand right now at this early stage what's going on, why were the numbers possibly so far off on the Klamath? I don't have the answer. Let me tell you, far more sharper people than me are gonna be debating this over the next two months and we're just gonna have to let it play out. Um, so it's all I can say is it would be really nice if these fish could all be in one bucket that I could see them and count them. I can't do that, and we're just going to have to live with the fact that this is complex science, and we're trying to do the best job we can by getting the best information. You know, that's just one other thing I'd like to toss out there. You know, these guys are all employees. They're all doing jobs, just like we do. And on the radio show, they don't participate in this discussion, I often say it, you're doing it with your hands tied behind your back in many cases. So it's not easy. Chuck alluded earlier to the fact that, you know, the feds are to want to do one thing or the Army Corps of Engineers wants to do one thing, the state of California wants to do another. It's happening all the time in many, many different arenas having to do with fish and wildlife. It's a tough world right now and the drought is not making anything easier for any of us. All right, I've got four quick little questions on here from somebody, and they're short and sweet, should be pretty easy. 
First one, I'd like to know why too, because I've been complaining about this since its inception. Why are licenses so damn big? I mean, I just talked to one of my buddies. He came by. His whole thing <laughs> stirred. Yeah, they're all going to pass this one around. <laughs> one buddy just came by and I said, we ought to measure that. And he said, you don't have to. It's 12 feet long. So, great question. Wasn't prepared for that. So this is a spontaneous answer. I don't know, but I'll look into making them shorter. Yeah. All right, his next question. Why an 8 a.m. abalone start time? Yeah, let me turn that over to Chief Carrion. But I look, figured you might. We took a series of options on abalone to the commission. I think we said somewhere between 7 and 8. The commission picked 8. There's an enforcement component you can't see to enforce in the dark. And we're trying to hold on to an iconic species that is subject to a lot of poaching. So figuring out a good moment in time in the morning was pretty important. Plus, we've got intertidal fishing pressure. Okay, thank you, Chuck. Yep, basically, it is a two-prong answer to that. Um, as you know, the abalone resources are hurting in, in California. We want to be able to make sure that there are going to be those abalone resources available in the future. So as they looked at how can you reduce some of the take yet keep opportunity out there, one of the things that was considered was a little later start in the morning. So there was a scientific end of that to help reduce some harvest uh, pressure. But the second part of it, and maybe a larger part, was the enforcement component. And if you can just think about the way our wardens are able to watch what's going on and to make cases on abalone, um, most of that's done from a long distance on a bluff with a, with a spotting scope or a pair of binoculars and you're watching activity and watching people, what they're taking and where they're putting those abalone. And, you know, at, at, at half an hour before sunrise, it's dark. You're not going to be able to see that. The ability to enforce the regulations more effectively was going to happen it, when it was lighter outside. So the proposals for the seven or eight o'clock that went to the commission was based upon the ability for the wardens to be able to see the activity that was happening and to help reduce the crime against abalone. And frankly, the better the deterrent value we have out there, the longer we're gonna have abalone as a sport fishery in our state. You know, it's already been taken away commercially and if the poachers keep doing the damnedest like they're doing, they're really putting a hurt on it. I'm frankly surprised abalone is still open. I'm glad it is. It's extremely tasty and I hope you'll continue to do that job on those guys. I got caught in one of the abalone stops one time. Talk about efficient. Whew. They were all over me. Well, here's another one and I don't know if this is the case and this one's yours too, carry on. Why are your vehicles not equipped with computer systems? Are they or not they? Not yet. <laughs> we actually are in the process of, of getting modernized in our, in our vehicles. One of the things that we did uh, for this last year was to finally get all of our officers smartphones so that you have access to computer databases, et cetera, that we did not have prior to last year. So that was the first step. Um, but there are many people looking at the most um, functional way that we can get computers put into the uh, vehicles. One of the things that's kind of a stumbling block for us is as you can imagine, warden vehicles go through quite a bit of abuse in the type of terrain that they're working in. And you can't just put any type of computer in there without having it get destroyed. So if they are looking at that, the state technology has to catch up to it and there are approval processes. Seb, let me add on there and just say, um, it was a great honor and privilege to work with Chief Nancy Foley as she was leaving the department and I was coming on in. And it's been, uh, incredible honor to work with Chief Carrion. And like I mentioned earlier, we have the division, law enforcement division, up to 396, which is high as it's been in 20 years. I know we need more. We're working on that. I will also tell you what's on my mind in large part. Look, I described to you that fish stuck between two birds pulling opposite directions across a huge jurisdiction. We're about 25, 2,600 staff. We may be one of the most over-mandated, under-capacity departments in the state of California. It's an incredible job. I think a testament to my tenure at director is how able I am to regrow the department. I'll give you some examples. We need to infuse back through our field operations um, modern vehicles. 
So I hope that you find when you're interfacing with our folks, they're able to tell you at a hatchery or out on our wildlife area, hey, yeah, current leadership was able to swap out our old truck for a new truck. I hope you hear that. We own and manage over a million acres. We need to take care of the deferred maintenance on that so you have the recreational opportunities out there in the field. We're largely, thanks to the budget that was announced this week, now thinking about through a $30 million infusion to our department. The first time that's happened in many, many years. Among other things, going and looking at our conveyance structure to deliver water around our property so that we can put water on our property at the right time of year to create hunting opportunity. Those are all things that relate to our ability to grow professionally produce product, become a sound investment, and then put it back into the assets for the benefit of your recreational opportunity. I've got another question here, and I want to preface it for you. It's from the audience also. You know, We've um, got to get something for Dan Perigari over there. Well, he might get into this one, but you'll probably chuckle a tad, just like I did. Those of us that uh, have been real close to the mountain lion issues, issues kind of know what's going on and how it all works. But there's one thing that I've found in the public is the information dissemination doesn't really get out super accurate all the time. And I've criticized the department for that several times. And they've, they are very good at correcting things. But this question is, why is the cougar, the mountain lion, still on the endangered species list? I know it's not. When they are becoming overpopulated in the state. So Dr. Loft, I would imagine, or Chuck, whichever one of you would like to straighten them out, get them in tune with what's really going on. Well, this is a loop back to Mr. Carr's original question at its heart. Management of mountain lion in this state was done legislatively. Um, they have a special status, but I'll leave it to Dan or Eric to fill in the blanks. Thanks. Yeah, good morning. I'd also like to, or afternoon, uh, echo my thanks for you guys uh, being willing to ask some hard questions. Um, it wasn't so much uh, legislatively the Mountain Lion Initiative of 92, 90. So that was one, uh, the will of the people. Uh, it wasn't uh, something that we asked for. In fact, uh, we didn't like it, I suppose, at the time. But uh, that's the law of the land. It was legislated that you could no longer hunt in California for mountain lions. Now, recently, we've even cut back. Go ahead. Hey, Sepp, just one other thing. Folks tend to forget that in 1989, the Department of Fish and Game proposed a limited hunt of mountain lions, and that's what brought about the change. Really? A little political influence, perhaps? Maybe so. Well, the cougar, you just can't hunt it anymore. And yeah, it's overpopulated. And yeah, we've all seen the photos on the internet with the guy sitting there with his beautiful deer and his young daughter next to him admiring the deer and the two eyes and the mountain lion six feet behind him looking at him. That's going to happen more and more. And I would caution all of you out there in the woods to be a little cautious what you're doing. Make a little noise unless you're out there hunting. Well, I've got a question that I wrote here too. It's not super, super... Uh, hot right now, but this is an issue that we've kind of talked a little bit about right now. You mentioned it briefly that you are looking at emergency plans to rescue fish. What is in place right now for the American River? Because I know it's a lot of concerns out here. What's in place on our other waters that are dwindling? What are we going to do? What's the first steps that we're going to be taking under these severe drought conditions? The American River, for those of you that don't know, the flows on it were cut last Friday from 1350 to 500 cubic feet per second coming out. That's not much water coming down the way for our fish. Makes it a lot easier for poachers, very accessible, and puts these fish in hazardous situations. Yeah, Stafford's gonna follow with the real content, but I'll just tell you each, we are thinking about these topics as to the American and other systems, principally in Northern California, right now. Uh, we're asking our staff to provide the data back to the fisheries branch, uh, and all options are in consideration for us at this moment. So it started at 6 a.m. on Monday this past week, and it's churned through today. Um, this is probably the only topic that I have been dealing with. 
Um, we have between 75 and 90 people looking statewide at this issue. So let's get to the American River. We have been out on a daily basis evaluating, is it really 10% or is it 12% or is it 30 or 40%? What is the effect on the fall run Chinook? Those eggs were in the gravel. Those juveniles are swimming up right now. And I'll just say this, the predation that's going on of those swim up juveniles by birds and other fish within that system, people haven't observed these levels before. So it is a big time issue. On top of that, the steelhead. We have an open steelhead fishery. So we have been giving it a lot of thought it's all I've been doing is asking, I've probably spent close to 30, 40 hours just in a 40 hour week in discussions with our top uh, scientists on what are our options on the American River. I don't have an answer yet. When we get to an answer, we will let the public know. The Fish and Game Commission will be examining whether an emergency closure on the American River is necessary on February 1st, uh, February 5th, pardon me. We will have a recommendation, yes or no. I haven't made that decision in collaboration with the rest of the department leadership. But I'll say this, it's not just the American. It is every stream system on our coast from the Smith River to south of Big Sur. Every one of these stream systems is in crisis mode right now. And whether it's drizzling now or whether we'll get any more storms, we don't know. All the best predictions are extended or intensifying drought for the next 60 days. That is a crisis. And as Chuck mentioned, we're looking at, how, are we gonna be having to do fish rescues? We had an unprecedented number of rescues of juvenile steelhead this past year, where we're talking t incident command systems of 30, 40 people. We have had the Calusa Basin issue where we've had endangered winter run that uh, we have rescued. Dan, I'd like to just make a correction to a statement you made about the population status of the winter run. I just signed a transmittal letter to the National Marine Fisheries Service. We're estimating our winter run is almost doubled from our estimate from last year. Good, but not good because these fish are in trouble with what's going on with our water supply system. Low water supplies and drought makes hard decisions even tougher. No question about it. You guys are in a hot seat no matter which way you go. I've got another 20 or 30 questions up here from the audience. We're running out of time rapidly. But one of the things I did, and you've already heard Chuck mention it, our director mentioned it, is I asked him outside, hey, there's going to be a lot more questions we can never get to. Would you guys like to do this again? Would you like to hear more from the department? Well, as you heard earlier, they're willing to make this an annual event. John Kirk, is it an annual event starting right now? The ISC is going to celebrate the fact that they will be here every year at our fair, talking and communicating with you just like this. I got a question up here that was um, not derogatory, but just frustrating. And it's a frustration because you don't understand how it really works. And I want somebody up here to clarify it. Mr. Carrion, you could probably do it very well, or Chuck. Now I gotta look at the note again and make sure I'm not screwing it up. They're ticked off that they're not getting some action from Caltip sometimes, the 800 number. One thing I'll step in right now and say, how many of you think the 800 number at Caltip's fishing game? It's not. It's a volunteer organization, a foundation that puts up the money that passes the information on the way I see it. Chief? Okay, that's, that's part one of the distinguishing between the two. The other thing is uh, Caltip does go to a dispatch center, and the dispatchers go and reach out to try to get an officer to respond to whatever that violation is. The bottom line is this. We have less than 300 wardens in the field on a, on a fully staffed day. 
and you know we got to accomplish the uh, days off and holidays and everything else so i mean the size of the state of california with 300 officers you just cannot possibly respond every time there's a call but we do get it assigned and somebody will eventually follow up they may not get there immediately but we do take it very seriously and we have a lot of great cases that come in through caltip so i got to encourage you to continue to use it the other part of it is in many cases when you call in a Caltip, you may not see an officer in their uniform on site because in order to make the case, many times we have to pull off quite a ways away, sneak into the area and watch the activity continue in order to make the case and to gather that information. So we may be making a stop after the person leaves the area if we were able to see what was going on. You don't always see the green truck pull up right after a Caltip is called and those are the types of reasons why. But it happens. One of my guides that's a regular on the show called Caltip one morning and said, there's a guy out here, he's just boated another big sturgeon and put it on board and he's not released it. It wasn't five minutes they came around the corner. He called me up raving about the department. Thank God they're there. That 800 number works. They prioritize because they have to. Chuck, you grab that thing. You must have something to say. I do. I have uh, two words to say. Thank you. Look, I... Uh, love this job in large part because of the people I work for uh, my sh fishing time has shrunk dramatically from my last job to this job but I suspect you have a similar experience when I can find time to go stand in a river and feel it flow uh, rub against my legs when I can cast when I can catch a fish. Mostly just the silence of being somewhere far removed to re-energize myself, uh, to think about things that matter to me as a person, to treat the backcountry as my temple as an individual for what matters to me and my soul. I think that's what drives us as hunters and anglers. Um, you're our past, you're our future. Um, we couldn't do it without you. Um, I know you're not going to be pleased with all our decisions all the time. I get that. Um, I'm just thankful you're passionate about the issues that matter to you as hunters and anglers. So I expect to see each of you, if not you plus a friend next year, right back here, same spot. Same spot. In the interim, you can always find out about us at www.wildlife.ca.gov. You can join our Facebook page. You can call any of our offices and ask any of the questions on your mind. You can email caloutdoors at wildlife.ca.gov, which most of you may know is Carrie's column, which is published, I think, weekly in WON and others. It just crossed its 700th article threshold, which is quite amazing. And as an individual, um, I hope your conservation hunting organizations like California Waterfowl Association, like California Deer Association, like Rocky Mountain Elk, so on and so forth, know that I'm available to attend, sit down, listen to their membership, like our conservation organizations on the fishing front, Golden Gate Salmon Association, California Trout, uh, California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance. We're open to the input from you on what we need to do better going forward. All right, I got one last comment. I want to walk along here and I'm going to say, Dan Perigary, gung-ho hunter and outdoorsman. Mike Carrion, gung-ho hunter and outdoorsman. Eric Loft, nobody likes animals and mammals more than you do in the outdoors. Stafford Lair, I've fished with you. You've been with Trout Unlimited. You're a woolly bug and fly, whatever they call it. He's a fly fisherman. Don't hold it against him. And you know what? They're just like you and me. They are us. They're doing the job the best way they know how for us. If we don't tell them when we're not happy, they're not going to know about it. If we tell them when we like something they do, they need to know about it too. Don't always point out the negative because we don't always know the whole story. In a world of California with knee-jerk reactions and political ramifications, these guys are doing a pretty damn good job taking care of things in the circumstances that they're having to deal with. And now it's even compounded with this really negative impact of the drought and not good news on the forefront. 
I want to thank each and every one of you for coming here. Nobody knew what would happen. More importantly, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming and participating today. I hope next year you'll bring your friends. And please, how about a round of applause for the guys that stepped up and got the word out. Chuck Bonham, our director of the Department of Fish and Game. Stafford Lair, the chief of fisheries. Dr. Eric Loft, the chief of wildlife. Mike Carrion, the Chief of Game Wardens, and Dan Perigary, the Deputy Director of Fish and Wildlife. Thank you all for coming. Have a great day at the International Sportsman's Expo.